Hello and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast. Today is Friday, March 27th, 2020. My name is Patrick James Lynch, and you are listening to another Bloodstream Mini. GIF, right? Friday, for me anyway, still carries that sense of another week winding down, another weekend on the horizon. Much has changed, but I'm holding on to that TGIF feeling today, and I hope you are too. This Bloodstream Mini includes conversations I had the last few days, first with my colleague and Ask the Expert host Amy Board to find out how she's keeping busy and what's on her mind, and you'll hear my catch-up call with fellow blood brother Michael Bishop. That's coming up in just a little bit. A few quick hitters before we get to Amy. The World Federation of Hemophilia announced the canceling, and that is the word they used, canceling, of their 2020 World Congress, scheduled to take place in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, in mid-June. Very disappointing, but frankly necessary and expected news. I do feel for the many thousands of people that this impacts. On a positive note, the Hemophilia Federation of America, which postponed its April symposium in Baltimore, has rescheduled for August 24th through the 26th in Baltimore, Maryland. HFA 2020 is back on. Visit hemophiliafed.org to learn more. Lastly, I'm proud that Bloodstream was able to provide three corona-related podcasts to emergency pods on March 6th and 13th, as well as updates from NHFCOO Don Rodolini and some input from expert hematologist Dr. Robert Sidonio on March 18th. Subscribe to the Bloodstream Podcast wherever you listen, as we will continue to produce emergency and pop-up episodes throughout the year as corona-related news and other news demands. And if you are looking for more information on the coronavirus and COVID-19 and how it may or may not impact our community, I'd highly recommend typing hemophilia.org into your web browser. That will bring you to NHF's homepage, which includes corona-related updates from NHF, HFA, MASAC, updates from manufacturers on how they're responding, all of that and more at hemophilia.org. All right, let's get to Amy. She is the host of the Ask the Expert podcast, the head of community engagement at Believe Limited, director of some upcoming Save One Life videos that are dope. She's from Colorado, but belongs to California, at least for now. She is Amy Board. Hi, Amy. Welcome back to Bloodstream. Oh my gosh, that was the best intro maybe ever. <laughs> I've had a lot of time on quarantine to work on things like intros, but how about you? How, what have you been doing on your quarantine? I was thinking like the one thing you could have added to that list was been in her jammies for the last nine days. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So the, so the dress down has at least been a highlight for you. Oh, man, it's been such a highlight. I've I've it's, it's going to be rough, like getting back into pants that have like actual waistlines. It's going to be a bummer. Uh, what part of this past couple of weeks has been most challenging for you? I think it's the um it's interesting. I I work from home actually. My my job is working from home all the time, and so I thought that it wouldn't um, change very much. But it's the perception that I can't go outside, and when I do, it's um, like I just need to be careful. Even if I go on a walk, you know, you see people move to the other side of the street, or you know, go around um, in the street to kind of like pass you, which is which is fine and what we all should be doing, and it's in a neighborly right. fashion. But it just feels odd. And so, um, I don't know, it just, it, it feels, um, it feels like I have to be in here and that's made it different. It's made, it's made it different. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And I found when I'm out walking Russell, you know, people still, some people want to interact with the dog or they want their dog to interact. So now we're kind of getting closer. So the last couple of days being like really strategically like, come on and like pulling them over here and pulling them over there and to your point it's like nice to be out but it also feels quite strange still like how we have to accommodate yeah yeah um well how have you passed the time any hobbies that you've picked up any movies that you've gotten to watch or books you've gotten to read anything that you've gotten to do like joyfully with a little bit of extra time on your hands well i think the thing that's been the most enjoyable is that i've started writing creatively in the mornings and i have wanted to do it forever and just never felt like i had the time what have you been writing and well i think you know i'm going through i'm going through one of those life things where you know you have like peaks and valleys and i'm going through um a bit of an emotional valley that's not um Hmm. it's it's not rough it's not 
particularly dark, but it's definitely some things have been provoked that um, I've needed to look at probably for a long time. And mm. through it, um, it's, it's very interesting that it's happening right now when we're all in quarantine. Hilarious that there's like nothing else to do, but like, you know, stare into the void of your interior world. But to one be thing- with yourself. I know. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'm very aware. I'm like, I think this is on purpose. But one <laughs> thing that's helped to get it out is to actually write creatively of what it feels like. And I've never had the opportunity. To do I've always been a journaler. You know, I've always just journaled to like help stimulate and move things around so I can just continue to think and engage with myself. But I've sure. never written um, with as much consistency. And so that has been the greatest thing uh, hmm. is the writing. Uh, do you have any kind of end game in mind or are you right now just committing to writing every day and we'll see where it goes? Yeah, I started rereading. If if you are a, a budding writer or if you're a writer and you haven't read this book, you need to. Um, I, re I reread uh, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamont. I don't know if you've, she's one of my favorites. She's uh, she's hilarious and she's wonderful and she's a faith-filled woman who is a raging liberal who's just nuts she's a recovering alcoholic and she's just marvelous and her mm. her narrative is great and she wrote this book bird by bird about uh about the writing process and she teaches writing classes and um she basically took her class and and wrote it and it's it's forever ago i was um i think it was <laughs> uh published I don't know, late 80s, early 90s, something like that. So it's it's been around for a while. But um, I started rereading it and just started doing what she said. She says, begin with your childhood and just, just write everything down. So that was how I started. And then now I just have just like these chunks of things that I am slowly starting to formulate like oh I think these could be like a series of essays on on just certain things so mm. um it's not fiction you know it's just it's me it's like personal essay stuff but at the same time there are things that are just dumped that I think I could use maybe at some point to like put something together at the moment I don't have anything that like makes an actual point you know when you just like sure, yeah, dump yeah. everything and yes. allowing that process without having a point without saying anything feels very very emotionally healthy right now so I don't know I don't know it might you know sit on my computer forever but it's been it's been what I've been doing <laughs> good that sounds great I'm very intrigued by that um and just before I let you go, uh, I mentioned, you know, you now live in California. You're from Colorado. Your family's back in Colorado. Um, how is your family doing? Oh, that's dear of you to ask. Um, my my parents are fine and my brother and sister-in-law are nurses. And so they're in the thick. Um, they actually have not received um, a COVID patient at their hospital yet, but they are fully prepped to do so. They have an entire floor that's dedicated to um, patients that might come in. They are a trauma hospital. They're right on the um, on the edge of the mountain, so they get a lot of ski accidents and car accidents and that type of thing. So th they probably won't be where people will go first. However, they're prepared, and they're just kind of bracing themselves. So it's been an interesting um, you know, kind of entryway into that world with them. And then my parents, of course, um, of just trying to, you know, as we're all dealing with our parents, like, you know, stay home, yeah. you guys, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you on that one. Well, you can, uh, listen to the latest episodes of ask the expert. Both of them came out this past week, Thursday and Monday over on the ask the expert podcast, subscribe to it while you're there. And Amy, uh, where can people find you on the social medias? Oh, please find me on Twitter. My handle is at Bordo 87. Please. I love the tweets. Please tweet me. Well, thank you, Amy. And thanks for a few minutes today. Absolutely. Thanks guys. Now for my catch up with fellow blood brother and podcaster, Michael Bishop. Michael is 27 years old, a web specialist for the Hemophilia Federation of America, and he hosts his own podcast called Blood Problems, on which he shares some really intimate and vulnerable experiences related to his hemophilia B. I'll let him tell you more about himself in just a moment, but first I need to let you know that the presenting sponsor of the Bloodstream podcast is Takeda, without whom none of this would be possible. Visit bleedingdisorders.com to learn more about Takeda and the resources that they provide for the bleeding disorders community. Again, that is bleedingdisorders.com. And hey, thanks Takeda. And now, on to my conversation with Michael. Joining me now is uh, my friend from Columbus, Ohio, Michael Bishop. Hi, Michael. How are you? Hi, Patrick. I'm good. How are you? You know, all things considered, doing all right. How have yeah. the uh, 
first couple. When did uh, the coronavirus quarantine life has changed? You can't go to the store anymore. When did that start for you? So I believe uh, rust restaurants and stuff shut down um, last week sometime. And then we just had a shelter in place start on um, Monday. So okay, it's, so it's, it's so kind fairly of it's new gradually, but yeah, it's, it's fairly new. And now it's, we're kind of at the place where only come out for, for groceries and, and medicine. And so what has, what, what has your last like week been? Have you been cutting back on activities? Have you found, has your lifestyle changed notably in the last week or two? Interestingly, I feel like I've been preparing myself for this for many years because I do not, <laughs> I do not do a lot of, I, you know, I work from home and then, um, am, am not someone that goes out, uh, a ton. So um, yeah. my life has been pretty similar. The only thing is I am getting a little stir crazy. Just not having the option to go out is, is kind of, um, the only, the only difference right now. And it does, it does feel a little weird to not be able to go hang out with my friends if, if I want to. Have you found film, TV, music, any particular outlets that you're, uh, going to these days? Totally. Yeah. Like I said, I'm home most of the time anyway, but for some reason, uh, the, the opportunity to go out being taken away from me has oddly enough inspired me a little bit creatively. So I have been, um, catching up on a lot of shows that I wanted to watch. I got the Blu-ray of Batman, the animated series. So I've been making my way through there you that go. and then have been doing, uh, doing more music stuff, which I had kind of put on the back burner for a little while. Um, and then, am doing, uh, podcasts as much as I can. I have, um, Blood Problems, which is a, a podcast that I do that I have a lot of fun with. And I've been writing a lot of scripts for upcoming episodes of that as I've had, had some downtime. Nice. Tell people a little bit more about that. Where are you in the process? What's coming up with Blood Problems? Sure. So I have I have three episodes out right now. Um, it's basically I, I, the tagline is Reflections on Living with Hemophilia. And the the first couple episodes were very intense and personal and, and just kind of reflecting on the psychological um, aspects of, of living with hemophilia. I'm trying to drift away from that a little bit and just kind of get more into a podcast that is uh, a hemophiliacs podcast, not necessarily one about hemophilia, but just one done by a hemophiliac. And since mm. it impacts my life so much, I know it's going to come up again and again, but um, I'm not, I'm not specifically trying to focus every single episode on a hemophilia centric topic. It's more just like whatever I feel like talking about. And most of the time that is something related to hemophilia or I can relate it back to hemophilia. Why did you make that adjustment? So the first, it actually just came as a result of doing the first couple episodes and taking a step back and realizing I'm, I'm like really mining the de deep recesses of my mind and getting into some gnarly stuff that I'm so happy to talk about because I do want to be open and vulnerable, especially as it relates to hemophilia when I know I have people with hemophilia or their families listening, but it was pretty emotionally exhausting. And I also didn't want yeah. to feel like I had to outdo myself every time and like come at you right. with darker and crazier stories every single time that I did that. And so, you know, the, the first couple episodes, the first one I think was on self image. And so I talked about how hemophilia led to me developing an eating disorder when I was um, in junior high school and high school. And the next one was about um, depression and, and future anxiety and stuff like that. And those were like huge topics that were very emotionally draining to do and cathartic to do. But I thought, you know, if I'm going to sustain this podcast, I can't have it be something that is so exhausting every time I'm going to do it for myself or for the listener. Cause I don't want them to come in and be like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I'm going to have to cry or whatever again, this episode. Sure. Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, well, and tell me about your music too. So you mentioned the podcast and the music. What is the music that you're working on? So I have, um, been making music for a really long time. And right now it's just solo stuff, mostly instrumentation. I just have a little MIDI controller and a guitar. And I love to pull samples from other music. And so I just kind of sit down and make, I guess you would define it as like electronic music. But whenever I say that, people always think electronic dance music, which it very much is not. It's just kind of softer, uh, piano focused, chill music. Where do you find your inspiration to write? Um, it kind of just comes from, uh, it's mostly 
finding a sample of another song that I really like. So say it's like um, some synthesizer that I, ju I just really like the chord progression of this synthesizer. And there's a couple great websites that have resources for samples and stuff. And so I'll just go to one of those. I'll find a little synthesizer that has a chord progression that I like, and then I'll write piano around that. And then I'll write drums around that. And it's not even anything that I, I am looking to put out or trying to make uh, a career or a career or even like a, a sustained hobby. It's just kind of something fun to do and a little bit of a, a creative exercise every time I go to do it. Well, good. I, I, have you shared anything publicly or at least with friends? I am actually planning on doing it. Like I said, this has been oddly creatively inspiring, this, uh, you know, hunkering down and, and isolating uh, social distancing. And so I, I am planning on putting out a little project, probably an EP of like five or six songs, just instrumentation. Um, and so I'm, I'm going back and looking at the stuff I've recorded and kind of compiling my favorites and, and making some new ones. And um, I'll see I'll see where that goes. For now, it's just been like a couple little clips on Instagram and stuff that are a minute long. But it could become your COVID EP. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, that's something to work work on. Um, do you generally, do you generally work, uh, when you're working on music, do you generally work on your own or do you have collaborators? I generally work on my own nowadays. When I was, when I was in high school, I really loved to work with other, other musicians and I still do, but just, you know, the, the friends that I had that were musicians either moved away or just stopped making music. And so these days I just kind of find it more convenient and, um, a little bit easier to just, to just do my own thing. But I love, I still love sending it to people to get their opinions on stuff. You know, people who, who make music or, or made music and whose opinions I respect, I will always send it to them and say, hey, do you think I should change this or that? Or what do you think of this? Yeah, and it's valuable as you're suggesting, sending it to people who make music, people who maybe listen to music and can critique it really well, a great musician, like people who have different angles on or perspectives on music. I find the same um, to be true in filmmaking where I want... Okay, I want people who know the subject matter. I want people who know filmmaking. I want people who are just people that go to movies and like movies. And let me get all of their opinions and see what starts to kind of pop through all of that. It's always it's really interesting. Yeah, definitely. I, I completely agree. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't it's not even necessarily that someone makes music, but just that I like their music taste or I, I've heard them talk about music passionately before. Just getting their opinion is is always very helpful. And how is your bleeder life at the moment? How are things hemophilia-wise? Um, they've definitely been better. 2020 has kind of been a, a rough year um, so far. Why is that? I, I had not been in the hospital since I was 17 or 16, and I'm 27 now. And I have been three times this year. Um, oh, wow. I just had, I had a knee bleed that got out of control in January. Um, and I just could not control the pain. And it got to the point where I could not give myself infusions anymore and just ended up having to take myself to the hospital. And then a month after that, last month, I uh, had a bleed develop in my iliopsoas muscle in my groin, which was also extraordinarily painful and got out of control. Mm. And I never have muscle bleeds. And so that was very strange. And then this month I have um, a kidney bleed, oddly, which is oh, definitely a weird one. And that one also... The, the pain kind of got out of control and I needed some assistance on, um, and I, you, you're not supposed to do factor for that one. So I just kind of felt helpless in my apartment with, with this going on. So huh. that brought me back to the hospital. So it's been, it's been an interesting year so far, hemophilia wise. Do you have any like idea as to why this is happening? I'm not sure. No, I, and unfortunately my, my primary HTC is still in Toledo where I'm from and I'm in Columbus now. And so it's a little bit of a drive and I, unfortunately only see them um at my yearly clinic uh mostly just because i didn't need to see them you know i was managing my hemophilia perfectly fine on my own and so i have not sure. had a chance yet to get to connect with them and, and sit down and maybe try to figure out why i'm bleeding so much worse uh this year and it's it's not like i didn't have bleeds before but these these have just been a little more intense than usual and mentioning that you don't generally get muscle bleeds, I take it you don't generally get organ bleeds either. That that to me also kind of suggests so what what is that little bit of movement yeah, going on there? Yeah, so. exactly. I had a kidney bleed when I was a kid, but yeah, I, I don't generally. It's mostly knees and ankles, you know, the traditional joint bleeds, and and so I don't yeah. I don't know what's going on, but it's been um, 
it's been mm-hmm. it's been interesting and reminding me that maybe I should be sl- signing up for some clinical trials or something because. Uh, well, I mean, there's a whole nother thing to think about, uh, and especially right now, I you know a few people who are on them and their lifestyle was already changed as a result of being on the trials and having to go in for follow-ups. And there's, you know, a fair amount of kind of ongoing activity that people might, might not be aware of when they first consider a clinical trial. But I know that's gone up, you know, three, four, five fold for people in the Corona outbreak and having to relocate right. to live closer to hospital. It's so yeah. this might, this might not be the time if you're not that's already true. on one to necessarily <laughs> yeah. sign up, uh, but you know, that's to each true. their own. A um, reminder that I should look, look into the future, <laughs> like wait, wait, but then when the time comes, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can do the research you know, now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. My treatment's always been pretty limited because I have, um, I have hemophilia B, but I have an anaphylactic reaction to factor nine products. So I've been on factor seven products my entire life, which is certainly less than ideal. And so I've always, I've always kind of been seeking other treatment and always been interested in, in the development of new treatments, but just haven't, haven't been able to sign up for anything so far. Is there anything that you're aware of that's uh, far along in the pipeline um, that you are particularly interested in or curious about? Uh, the one that's stuck out to me so far is, um, um, Fetusaran. I, Mm -hmm. I I know another Mm -hmm. hemophilia B patient who has anaphylaxis, who is actually on one of the Fetusaran trials and it, it's been going pretty well for him. I, the, the trial itself has had some issues, um, in the past, but he, his quality of life improved dramatically. And so that one has always been, been interesting to me and I've been, kind of quietly trying to see if I could, I know there's some that happen in Michigan and a couple that happen in Ohio. So I've been um, dipping my toe in the water and just letting people know that I'm interested to see if maybe I can get, get that phone call and see if I can uh, get on one of those. You know, this question probably doesn't have, it's, it's odd to ask it at this particular time, but as a, as a guy in his mid to late twenties and who has hemophilia, um, are you noticing ways in which it's impacting your adult life that maybe it didn't when you were in high school, college years, early 20s, even those you know, 23, 4, 5? I feel like once you get to that 27 range, it's kind of a different phase of life, uh, at least for me, that was the experience. Have you noticed hemophilia um, influencing work life, social life, any aspect of being uh, a 27-year-old? I think so, yeah. I, I would agree with you. Um, and I think... I think one of the primary differences between being this age and being um, younger is there, I always had something where there was an aspect of of forced socialization in my life. There was always school Mm. or, um, Mm. well, I guess it was, it was primarily school, but that, that was how I met new people, developed new relationships, romantic or otherwise. And, and now as I move into my late twenties, where people kind of are establishing their careers and are a couple years removed from college, they've settled down a little bit and, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I'm not someone that goes out generally. And so it's been difficult to develop new relationships. And I didn't enter this phase of my life with a significant other. And so that's probably the primary thing that I think of um, when you mention that. It's just developing developing new relationships is, is certainly more difficult um, now. I mean, especially this year since I've been in and out of the hospital and off my feet for all but a couple days this year. It's been it's been incredibly difficult to date. I mean, it's been virtually impossible, and so I see I see that as the probably the biggest difference. Um, thankfully, I've has that always, been hard? Yeah, that it's been <laughs> impossible. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I I am um, I'm not someone that's ever needed to be in a relationship, and so it it doesn't really bother me um, every day. But it, it is still certainly something I think about. It's 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 a bummer. Um, and of course, there's a bunch of dating apps and stuff now that that make that stuff a little bit easier. But um, I'm not the best on those, and and so if I don't find success <laughs> on those, there's kind of like nothing else to do. So it has been it has been a little bit of a bummer, and it's it's certainly been an adjustment from you know aging out of the times in my life where I was just around people all the time because we were all going to school or whatever. It's so interesting. So you mentioned earlier not going out a lot. Um... Um, and when I asked about music, you mentioned working on your own and I, I sense that you and I have this in common a bit that we tend to be a a little bit of isolationists, a little bit hermetic if we have Mm -hmm. the option. Um, and so I've certainly noticed during my lockdown period that, 
there's plenty of terrible things happening. I acknowledge that. But on a personal level, staying at home and like I, I, I too work from home and there's food here. My dog's here and yeah. my wife, when she's not working, is here. Like I, I'm pretty good. I, yeah, I'm right. really learning just how much of an introvert I am. But I also hear other commonalities in your and my story, uh, anxiety, depression, and these things that can only be triggered or exacerbated by isolation, loneliness. So there's a little bit of a double-edged sword for mm -hmm. that kind of loner way of life in my experience. And I'm curious for you, as you mentioned, you're not with a partner. We are in a time where it's like, even if your inclination is to be a, a, a loner and in isolation, you kind of have to be right now. Is any part of you, I don't want to say concerned, but just kind of like keeping an eye on, on your health in that regard? You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And um, that actually makes me think of a, a, another big change that happened from um, my early 20s and to now my, my later 20s is I, I started having anxiety attacks associated with with my bleeds. And I think hmm. those I've, I've tried to unpack them many times and I, you know, they're they've been um, less frequent now, thankfully. And so I think I have done work successfully on those. But I, I really think they came as a result of every every bleed I get now, I kind of feel a little bit more than I did when I was younger. When I was younger, I felt like I bounced back quicker and and as high as I was before that bleed started. And now that I'm older, I think I don't bounce back as quickly and I, I feel the difference and I don't bounce back as high. And it makes me, I call it future tripping, where I, I just, you know, kind of extrapolate that and think, okay, well, if this is, you know, how I felt from 25 to 27, 27 to 30 is going to look, you know, I'm going to look a lot different when I'm that age too. And right. so it's, it's given me a lot of anxiety for, for the future. And I think every time I get a bleed, it just kind of triggers that. And, and so I'm trying mm -hmm. to be more conscious of that. And I'm trying to, um, I'm just trying to establish uh, a life that, that is pointing me in the direction where I want to go. And, you know, I'm trying to meet new people and trying, trying to date and most importantly, trying to um, get that stuff under control and do a lot of self-reflection and make sure that, that I'm, I'm in a good place mentally for, for myself as well. And how are you feeling professionally? Um, where are you at in your professional life? And um, what are you thinking about as you kind of future cast a little bit professionally? So I work for um, the Hemophilia Federation of America. I absolutely love that job. It, it enables it, it enables me to work from home, which is which is great. And I'm I'm their web specialist, which is stuff I love doing. And I'm just kind of, you know, trying to develop creative stuff on the side as I can. You know, we already talked about I I like doing music. I like podcasting. I'm um, a bit of an illustrator as well, and I do some autobiographical um, comics. I really like doing that stuff. I went to school for writing and so I write quite a bit too and I'm working on a series of essays about my dad and and so I, I'm I'm hmm. uh, pretty content in this space where I, I have this this career that I'm working on and then also on the side developing these creative projects that hopefully I can take somewhere as well. Good for you, man. Well, it's uh, been really great to catch up a bit and I would encourage everybody who's listening to go check out Blood Problems. And uh, you can hear a little bit of the deep dive into Michael's mind that he was describing. <laughs> I will say, and I both appreciate as a communicator being in that spot at times, but then also as a listener, when I was listening to, I forget if it was your first or second episode, it was the first one that I listened to. Um, I was also reminded of how beneficial it is to have someone who's willing to go there, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I think I sometimes question, oh man, I feel it's, it, costs a lot to go there and to yeah. sometimes put some of this stuff out there and then do I want to do that and then when I'm on the other side and there's another artist or communicator or whomever it may be who's willing to go there I'm rem I'm reminded of why it's important because I feel less alone I feel more seen even when I hear someone else describing problems that I resonate with I feel more heard and seen even though they're the one talking so um, I totally appreciate your, uh, I want to pull back and make sure like there's a nice balance here, but, um, from a listener standpoint, thank you for sharing as openly as you have. And to the degree to which you're comfortable and find that beneficial for you, I would encourage you to keep doing it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes, I certainly, um, 
as I as I move forward, I I will be shifting my focus a little bit, but the the openness and vulnerability will certainly still be there. And if something gnarly happens, I will definitely be talking about it. I do. Um, one of my plans is to talk about my father and and a, a couple other things that are heavy t- heavier topics that will require mm-hmm. some openness and vulnerability. Because I agree with you, just hearing another hemophiliac speak openly about that stuff makes makes me feel less alone too and and that's part of the reason why i started doing it and i I find it incredibly beneficial for myself and i've heard a lot of kind words from from you and and people like you um about the episodes and and that makes it even even more fun to do and and feels even more important when i'm doing it so i i will definitely be keeping that up and it's it's certainly an aspect just of my personality generally but also as my uh creative personality as well it's always just been very very open (laughs) So make sure to go check out Blood Problems. And Michael, thank you again for a little bit of your time today. Of course. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you, Amy and Michael, for joining me. Go check out Brian on the Ask the Expert podcast. Check out Michael's pod too, Blood Problems, and subscribe to Bloodstream, Ask the Expert, and Blood Problems. Blood Problems is not technically part of Bloodstream Media, but who am I to discriminate? Go subscribe to all three pods wherever you listen. Tell a friend about Bloodstream Media. Email Bloodstream Media mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com or ping me, Patrick James Lynch, across the socials with feedback or suggestions for future episodes. Thanks again to Takeda for making this possible, bleedingdisorders.com, to learn more about them, fellas. Thanks for listening. My name is Patrick James Lynch, and until next time, take self-care of yourself. Bye, everybody. Bye.